For this video, we're going to cover the types of error that occur during an inspection or during a manufacturing process. Uh, we'll talk about the sources as well as how to mitigate them, minimize them, and if possible, eliminate them. And we're going to look at this in terms of many perspectives. There's sources of error that come from the gauges themselves, um, that come from the, the parts. The parts have errors that can lead to a mismeasurement or, or a bad decision. Um, there's environmental errors uh, or sources of error, I should say. And then of course there's human errors. So we're gonna talk about the most common ones and, and how to minimize them. We'll also get into the 10 to one rule of thumb and the uncertainty ratio. Um, two concepts that uh, are closely related and have been around a long time and um, really help with decision making. So let's jump into it. Um, so sources of error. First of all, everything in the inspection environment has the ability to introduce error into every measurement. So uh, the environment, the person, the gauge, the part. Um, but if you have good standard practices and techniques, uh, they will help you mitigate and control them, have a minimal effect on your measurement. So any video you've watched, um, you know, about the, the gauges, I've talked about how it's important to have a good technique, a standard approach, a standard method, so that everything you're doing is repeatable on some level. Um, and when we talk about the major sources of error, gauge calibration is a big one, gauge condition, um, part in the form error, I've talked about form error a lot, um, circularity, cylindricity, flatness, um, straightness, those types of errors uh, are, are inherent in the part that you're inspecting. You have the environment, temperature, and humidity, and then you have your technique as a human, as an inspector or a machinist, um, and then the assumptions you're making. Assumptions are sometimes wrong. Sometimes assumptions are a source of error. So um, we're going to start off with gauge error. So um, every gauge has a minimum possible error, right? So with a caliper, if you watch the caliper video, you know every reading you take is basically plus or minus one thousandth or plus or minus two thousandths. That's just the the accepted accuracy of, 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 a, of a caliper that as an industry, we, we understand that this is not the most accurate tool that we've used. And with a micrometer, it's plus or minus one ten thousandth. And, and those numbers vary based on manufacturer, based on size of the, of the gauge as well. Um, but the minimum possible meaning under um, the best conditions, you know, the worst amount of error you will see. So um, you could see more error than plus or minus one uh, with a caliper. Certainly if you have bad technique, if you have a gauge in poor condition, you could see worse than that, but you're not gonna see better than that. So for example, this caliper plus or minus two thousandths error means every measurement you take could be high or low by two thousandths from the, from the measurement you took. Uh, you can't assume better, okay? Um, even if you think like, yeah, I've really used this caliper. I know, I know, I, I know this caliper. I've used it for years. Um, I've, I know when it's, when it's gotten better accuracy and when it hasn't, that's really not, you can't, um, you can't rely on that to, as a scientific way of, of, of determining the accuracy. Um, and so um, that last bullet point, again, I've said error can grow if the gauge is in poor condition or has a calibration problem. So you don't always assume, yeah, it's plus or minus two. You've got to verify the gauge is in good enough condition to reach that level. Um, so when we talk about calibration errors, first of all, there's no calibration. Yeah, you're not checking it. There's no sticker. When you're in a shop environment, a company, right, uh, they're going to usually be under some sort of calibration record that involves stickers. And so, sometimes a sticker is not good enough. A sticker is just a sticker. You actually have to verify it's in good condition. Um, so that's one, um, that's one error I, I've, I've noticed is if a, uh, if a gauge has a one year calibration cycle, some people will assume 
that the gauge is in calibration for that entire year because the sticker says it is. And, and that's, not, that's not the case. Do not assume that. Um, the reason we have calibration cycles is because gauges go out of calibration. And you are taking the risk that you're saying, yeah, I don't think it's going to go out for a year, but it, possibly it could. I mean, otherwise we would never need to calibrate anything if everything stayed perfect. So some people just, yeah, they see the sticker, they assume it's in good calibration, but the best thing to do would be periodically during that calibration year cycle, grab, uh, grab some Joe blocks and verify, uh, or whatever gauge it happens to be, whatever calibration standard is with it. Um, another calibration, you can calibrate it wrong. If you've watched me in, in these other videos, I have, you know, made some mistakes in calibrating that I had to fix. Um, that's certainly possible. Um, another mistake a lot of people do, or not mistake, but one of the errors is if you only check calibration at one point in the stroke, uh, you're going to miss other points of the stroke that may or may not have more error. Um, when I when I did the calib, um, I've talked about how a micrometer can have a perfect reading when it's closed at zero. But um, as you check other points, it may have more error. Uh, that can be due to wear. That can be due to a problem, some looseness that's only uh, affecting at one point. The frames can be bent so that, yeah, you can close it at zero. You can calibrate it at zero. But with a bent frame, it's no longer traveling straight. And you'll get different readings at different points. Um, so uh, there's another, another video where I talk about... Um, linearity and uh, repeatability, uh, accuracy, precision, that, that video, the accuracy, precision, R&R, &R, I, I really went into, into that discussion. Um, so you want to check these at multiple places. That can be an error. If you're only checking it when it's closed and then you use it at the 38th inch, they're going to have different performance. So um, definitely check that. Um, and then neglecting the environmental conditions when you're calibrating, you have to, you know, every calibration should be under a controlled environment, a consistent temperature. You don't want to calibrate these things at 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer and 60 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter. That wouldn't really wouldn't make sense. You want to try and calibrate things at the same temperature year round and use them at the same temperature year round within some allowable margin. Um, next up, part error. So it's not really the part's fault <laughs> that it has some error. It's the manufacturing process. But, um, you know, these have flatness errors. They have cylindricity and circularity errors. And so what some inspectors will do is they'll only check something at one point and get one reading but the part has some circularity error or cylindricity error, which is basically, it's not perfectly round. It has, um, you know, kind of an, uh, an elliptical shape to it. It's no longer perfectly round. Um, and if you're not checking that, you're making a mistake, potentially. Um, same thing with flatness. You could be measuring, you know, the distance of these holes relative to this surface down here. And well, how flat is the surface? You, if you don't know, if it's not flat, uh, maybe the part's rocking, you know, maybe the it's wavy, and you're doing it with a caliper, and you're getting all sorts of readings, whether you go back to front um, here, or maybe you're using a surface plate, and you're going up from the surface plate, and you're getting a different reading. Um, that's an error that, that may be affecting your final measurement. And that's all down to the part. That has nothing to do with your gauges. Um, so every process, right? Every process has its strengths and weaknesses. And the process that's chosen is usually meant to give the, the least amount of error in, um, in contrast to cost, right? Cost and quality are always dueling against each other. You want the highest quality at the lowest cost, and then you compromise each one a little bit. So you're going to pick the error, but every process has some error, whether you use a lathe or a mill or an extrusion process or any other manufacturing process. It has its strengths and weaknesses, and as 
manufacturing people, as inspectors, it's really important to know. I know that when I check this part, uh, you know, I have a, I know what manufacturing process went into it, and I know the um, the errors. For so, for example, if if this is interpolated on a CNC mill, you know, the the profile of it, I have a strong suspect. I strongly suspect it's going to be tapered um, as it as it worked its way down. Um, if it's rotated around and milled many, many times, well, that makes things probably more flat, but then I have some perpendicularity questions because of all the rotations that happen. So um, that's some of my experience, but your experiences are probably different. Um, but, you know, the part itself can introduce some errors. Surface finish, that's another great one where if you get a really rough surface finish and your anvils are grabbing onto a rough surface, it can affect your reading. Um, chatter is something we talk about. Chatter can be inside of uh, holes or on the outsides of diameters uh, on the lathe process. And a mill can even chatter as well and, and give you some bad surface finish. Um, so, I, you know, some tips for mitigating. Check multiple spots. You know, get a feel for the entire size of the feature you're checking and check those features that you're using um, to get between other features. Uh, and if you get strange readings, get another gauge. You know, sometimes another gauge can operate a different way. You know, if I use a caliper to get this one and I use a whole mic, the whole mic's going to register on three points and self-center. The caliper is going to register on two points and somewhat self-center if I use the right technique. Um, but they'll be measuring in different ways. And then you have to balance the cost of inspection against the odds of failure, right? How much effort you put into it. I, I use the, like I said, use the, use the print for all your decisions and how much effort you put into it. Tighter tolerance, more effort. Looser tolerance, less effort. It's pretty much that simple. Occasionally you'll have these borderline cases where an open tolerance feature is out which you wouldn't expect, but sometimes it happens. And there's other times where a tight tolerance features out and you're like, wow, like it's way off. <laughs> it's a big mistake here. So um, you could find that very easily. Um, so it's always that balance. And that's judgment calls. Sometimes companies let you make those calls yourself and sometimes they're, they're made for you. Um, we're going to move on to the environmental errors. So environment's very important in manufacturing. Um, typically, you want some control. It doesn't matter. Well, control is more important than what you control it at. So um, many gauges, accuracies, and uncertainties are stated at a very specific temperature because they're temperature dependent. So that temperature and humidity, usually around 20 degrees Celsius, 68 Fahrenheit, which is pretty cold, right? And uh, humidity is just controlled, um, not necessarily um, specifically stated. Um, catalogs publish this. You know, if you're looking at gauge catalogs, um, you'll see this number published sometimes. Some other makers don't publish it, but um, some of the better ones do. And that allows easy comparison of, of values. If you know everything's, if all the accuracies are stated at at the same temperature, you have a baseline comparison, but if it's different temperatures, it's really hard to compare. Um, but as a manufacturer, as an inspector, you know, companies get to decide what temperature and humidity conditions they work at. So um, whether it's controlled very tightly uh, year round, temperature control, humidity control, I've worked in an environment like that. I've also worked in an environment where the company just didn't have the resources to do that. It didn't makes sense for their product. So they had a larger range of travel, but they still controlled it. And they had some controls to keep, you know, manufacturing equipment, parts, gauges, all in the same environment. So um, at least if things were changing, you know, the temperature was changing throughout the year, summer and winter, throughout the day, night, and, you know, afternoons, um, everything was changing at relatively the same rate. Um, not, not ideal, but that's what many businesses will do because they don't have the resources as to, to do a year round control at a very specific setting. So again, your rules of thumb, be consistent, have some control over your strategy. 
um, keep everything together, keep the parts, the gauges, the equipment for manufacturing together in the same environment if you can. Your calibration masters, you know, not just your, your working standards, but your masters that you're using for official calibrations. Um, and, you know, I've had some discussions about, you know, when you're transferring between environments, because that's probably a requirement for many manufacturing. They have different environments, different rooms. Um, maybe they may be bit different buildings, you know, I would say the best strategy would be employ a bath. You know, if this came from an outside vendor on a shipping truck, um, the, you know, maybe the best practice would be to wait 24 hours for it to accumulate, accumulate to the environment that you're going to inspect it in. And that's not always necessary and that's not always practical, but, uh, I would say it's something to consider. Um, you will get better accuracy, especially on tight tolerance features, because when it's outside on a truck or in another vendor's shop, it's in a different environment and it takes some time for the materials to, to reach a stable temperature that matches what, what you're using. Um, so when we talk about some specifics, temperature, right? So we know from, you know, high school science and, and you know, if you've taken college courses like we know that materials grow and contract based on temperature changes. And the, the effect can be large or small based on the material. Aluminum is going to be a part, uh, is going to be a material that changes much more than a, a granite. Uh, so um, one way to, to minimize the effect is just keep everything together. At least if the temperature is changing, they'll all be exposed to the same environment and changing at the same, not, not the same rate, but their own particular rate, you know, aluminum will change, will grow more than, than a granite, but they'll at least be growing under the same conditions. Um, and then try to avoid situations where you're actually calibrating, um, you know, I'm calibrating this mic when it was at one temperature and my master was at a different temperature, that would be something you don't want to do because there'll be different sizes and they'll be calibrating. And then when things change back to their normal temperatures, the calibration may be out. Um, so the temperature, like I said, it's a, it's substantial. It can be minimized. A lot of the minimization comes from the materials that are chosen for gauges tend to be more stable. So a granite rock here, surface plate, it's not going to grow very much. That's why granite is very stable. We can manufacture granites at, at very, um, very tight flatness, which is what we want. Flatness, repeatability on, on, a, on a granite surface. So that's why granite's been chosen and used throughout industry. Um, but the materials that go into, into making gauges... Um, some of them are chosen to be temperature stable and some of them are chosen to, re to resist, uh, corrosion because they're exposed to coolant and, and other things. So there's a combination of factors that go in, but generally speaking, they're going to choose temperature stable materials whenever possible, as long as it satisfies these other requirements. So even this, this micrometer frame, it's a very temperature stable material compared to the moving components, which are metal. So you want to hold it. Most of your time holding it, you want to be holding the frame on this temperature stable material because your body heat will will affect uh, whether your temperature is hotter or cooler. There will be some heat transfer between this. So you want it to be in the more temperature stable side. Um, so like I have an example here, a CMM, big, huge, complicated system, moving parts, pneumatics, you know, air bearings and uh, big granites and big bridges. You know, I, I've worked with big CMMs and I've worked with gantry CMMs that, you know, you could drive a forklift under and, and drop your part off. Huge systems. So the gauge companies are really putting some effort into designing these, uh, these materials so that they can maintain the accuracies that they publish. We know CMMs are, are extremely accurate, probably... Um, maybe even more accurate than this micrometer in many cases. So, um, and they're much more versatile. They can inspect many different things or automated. So, 
um, they're choosing these materials, factoring in accuracy and uh, as well as temperature control. And actually, you know, on a, a slide aside, uh, many CMMs have a temperature measurement, you know, a thermometer, thermocouples in the system to measure what temperature the machine at, and it can actually compensate um, your measurement. Uh, but that's a that's a completely different subject to, to wander off into. So we'll move on next to humidity. So humidity itself doesn't, you know, you don't need a hard number. You just need to control it. Um, and it, it's basically the amount of water in the air can affect the, the accuracy of many instruments, even lead to corrosion in some case if it's really humid and you have a gauge in already poor condition. So electrical contacts and optical sensors, lasers, um, magnet, uh, light-based scales, optical flats, they, they can all be affected by humidity. Um, so generally speaking, we try to control it and we want dry air. So 40% to 70% is recommended. That is, um, that is not only good for the gauge, uh, but that's also good for the humid, right? We, we, if humidity was zero, would, would, would humans be very comfortable working in that environment? If humidity was 95 or 100, would we be very comfortable in that environment? No. So they, there's a compromise between, yeah, the gauge, the gauge probably wants like 5% humidity or zero, but um, people don't like that dry. So uh, there's a little bit of compromise there. Um, next up, we talk about humans. You know, I just mentioned humans comfort. Well, there's also human errors, right? And there's a huge variety of errors we can introduce. Um, you know, we make mistakes. Sometimes it's a mistake that's it's just a mistake you could have made in any industry, a math mistake, comprehension mistake, a reading mistake. Um, and, 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 that's, and that's, you try to minimize that. A lot of companies have controls in place to, to check the, the biggest mistakes when you're filling out your check sheets. You have computers involved, like taking a measurement and recording it so that the human doesn't type it in wrong or write it down wrong. Um, but... Um, you know, I've read, you know, studies have shown that inspector will only catch about 80% of problems under typical circumstances. So what that basically means is if I have to inspect this part, um, and there's a bunch of problems in this part and this lot or all the other parts I'm checking, if you're relying on the person to get all of the errors, that's a bad strategy, even under the best training the best conditions, I'm still only going to get about 80% of the problems. Um, you know, we do our best, uh, but it's a challenging industry, you know, insp for inspection to, to catch everything. The better strategy is to have inspectors verifying good work rather than catching problems and that all the problems are being prevented upstream. Uh, but um, it's, it's, it's a part of the game. So, um, you know, that bullet point there where I talk about sampling and average quality limits or, sorry, acceptable quality limits. Um, we're not doing 100% inspections on every feature on every part. The whole point of quality control is kind of to minimize costs while um, guaranteeing quality. So there's kind of a, a math formula that's played out. Uh, if you spend a bunch of money to verify 100% inspection, is that money better spent somewhere else? Can you get away with a much lower inspection percentage and, and invest that money in a better process and a better product? So um, when I, you know, I have a, I'll, I'll be talking about sampling in, in this video series and, um, you know, we, we, we generally don't, inspect 100%. Um, in some cases we do, depending on part complexity, that might call for 100%. But a typical part that has some complexity, but not total complexity, we'll, we will be sampling. And the percentage involved is it's not a 10%. It's not a 15 or a 5%. That We don't do it that way. That's not a blanket statement. We have a formula to follow. Um, but the point is, if you're relying on the sampling to catch 100% of the errors, it's probably not 
depending on how the sampling plan is implemented. Um, but sampling plans are designed to catch um, errors inside of lots and reject the whole lot to make sure you know that that lot didn't go out to the customer. But at the same time, there's an AQL and acceptable quality limit where you say, yeah, we'll accept 1.5% error for cost savings and the customer won't care about it. And if everything's implemented correctly, yeah, you're still gonna have some bad product that goes out that gets past inspection that won't necessarily be, um, won't necessarily be because the inspector missed something or because the inspector followed the sampling plan and the sampling plan allows for some to get through sometimes. Um, you don't like it, but a human decided that sampling plan. So that's kind of a, a larger discussion for, for another video. But um, that last bullet point, again, it affects every industry. If you're, um, if you're distracted, if you're tired, if you have bad technique, you have somebody who hasn't been trained properly, um, you can still make simple mistakes. I've, I've worked with machinists who've been doing this longer, you know, my whole life, basically, they've been machinists. And um, every once in a while, they bring me apart. And it's like, dude, you're off by 0.1 of an inch. <laughs> like, you know, you just, just make a mistake. And sometimes there have been a couple cases where the machinist made it wrong, and I inspected it wrong, because I made the same mistake the machinist made. Sometimes you get into a into a little false sense of security since um, you're complacent. That's not the right word. You're comfortable. You're, you're, you're not, you know, you're using this caliper. You've been using it a long time. You're checking parts. You're like, oh, yeah, 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 it looks good to me. You're focusing on the dial. You're not focusing on the entire scale. And that's how I let, uh, that's how I let a part through that was 0.1 of an inch off, which should be very easy to see. Fortunately for me, the machinist saw it when he made his second part and he was comparing them and like, <laughs> he found the error. So we both made it, we both made that mistake on the first part. Um, so personality too, right? There's some personality issues that, um, not issues, but personality quirks that, that people have. Um, there's a few of them here that I've highlighted um, that pertain to inspection in particular. First one called pencil whipping. <laughs> You don't want to pencil whip something, you know, it basically means you didn't do the inspection, but you filled out, you filled out that you did, or you signed off that you did. And, you know, people do that because they're confident in the part, you know, they're confident in what's been made and they feel like they don't need to verify it. And one of the other reasons would be they don't have enough resources. They don't have time to verify it. So they pencil whip it. And Either case is not acceptable. And, you know, if you're just being lazy, you're in the wrong industry, really. So pencil whipping is really not acceptable. If, if you're in that situation where you feel like you just don't have enough resources, you know, you got to talk to somebody about that. And if you're in a situation where you feel like it's not necessary, the quality is there, you can also talk to somebody about the level of inspections you're doing and change the sampling or change when the inspection happens or how it happens. You know, there's different, there's, there's discussions that should be had. You shouldn't just pencil whip it. Um, next one we call flinching. So if a measurement is out of tolerance, but it's only slightly, some people will round the measurement down or up into tolerance. Um, and that's to, you know, sometimes that's to help a part pass. Sometimes that's to avoid all the paperwork that comes with it, all the corrective actions and, remaking the part. And I think people have good intentions most of the time for that. I know I've been in the situation where I've measured a part and it's out of tolerance. And I'm like, this tolerance is pretty tight. It should be much larger. We shouldn't be controlling it this tightly. I know what the part does. And um, I've been tempted to flinch and um, I don't think I ever have, maybe on a bad day I have um, when I'm tired, but really I'd always check with engineering, get some buy off, verify that I'm right, get a red line. And, um, and that's all you have to do. That's all you gotta do. You gotta ask, you gotta check with somebody, check with engineering, get a red line. Um, if the tolerance needs to be changed for costs, right? This is a cost situation where tolerance is too tight. We might be rejecting a part that doesn't need to be. And it may not even show up in like an accounting sense of like, 
yeah, we decided we're going to use the part. It doesn't show up as a rejected part, but there was time involved, people's time, time is money. Um, and then this last one, huh, this is one I can relate to personally, um, pressure. You know, some strong personalities in a shop can pressure an inspector into passing a part with a multitude of reasons, excuses, or grumpiness. Um, and this has been my experience. I'm, I'm very, well, not very young, but I'm, I have, I'm one of the younger people in the places I used to work. And as an inspector, working with machinists with much more experience and much more, um, you know, just older. And so um, when I was inspecting uh, their parts and I, I found an issue, you know, some of the, some of the other issues I've talked about or have come up, well, you know, the tolerance is not, not important. You know, the print says one thing, but I know assembly wants it a different way, whatever. Look, it, it doesn't matter, but they're applying pressure to me or they're applying to a pressure to an inspector. Like, Hey, we spent 18 hours making this. Don't be the guy that, that screws everything up. Right. Um, so, but, you know, quality control is black and white. If you've watched my, uh, blueprint, um, videos, I talked about how you have to, you know, this is a contract. This is the ultimate authority. This is the contract for what, for what we are, for what we are doing, the blueprints, the requirements. So you gotta, you gotta talk to somebody about that. Talk to supervisor, talk to somebody more experienced, get red lines, from engineers if necessary. And hopefully all of this happens upstream, all this conversation before it gets to quality control, before it gets to the person checking it, should have happened upstream in the, in the ideal situation, right? And then in, when it gets to inspection, if the requirements had changed because of a red line that's already there, um, hopefully that's the case. So, but don't, don't flinch, don't, you know, don't pencil whip, because somebody's pressuring you to, because the deadlines are pressuring. It might not be the production person. It might be the supplier. It might be a planner. Uh, it could be assembly. It could be anybody in, in, in the chain. But, you know, just rely on the fact that prints are contracts and you're enforcing this. And, and, and everybody should understand that in a good environment. So we're gonna move on to something, we're gonna shift, shift gears, it's a little more scientific, a little less personality driven. Um, we're gonna talk about the, the 10 to one rule of thumb. And so this is a concept a lot of people understand in the industry and a lot of people um, have applied. Um, it's also an area that is kind of loosely defined. It was always meant, you know, a rule of thumb is not meant to be applied strictly. So uh, we're going to go through it because it's so prevalent in the industry and it is, it does help you make some decisions. Um, so where it started, military standard 120, 1950, uh, it says the accuracy of the measuring instrument should be less than 20% of the tolerance on the gauge being expected. However, an instrument which has an accuracy of 10% of the gauge tolerance should be used when available. So basically this is an example. If your tolerance zone is 10 thousandths, you want a gauge that has a resolution of 1 thousandth. That's how you pick the gauge you're going to use. Um, so if it's 10 thousandths, you can't use a steel rule. A steel rule doesn't have that resolution, but a caliper does. And if your tolerance zone, if this represents 1 thousandth, 10% of that is going to be one ten thousandth, which is where you're going to pull out your micrometers. So it's a rule of thumb. You know, this is as detailed as it really got. No one, no, nobody else really stated that it was required. It says that it should be used. Um, um, and, you know, when you think back to 1950, when this came out, GD&T was just starting. Um, not a lot of the tools that we're using today were as, um, you know, we're still using micrometers, we're still using calipers, but nothing was digital, right? Height gauges were probably vernier scale or, um, or dial and, and, and they were not, um, they were not digital. 
the cost in general has gone, you know, height gauge used to be a really big investment, you know, surface plate, but as manufacturing has gotten better at it, the prices in general have dropped, um, you know, adjusting for inflation and all, but, uh, and then we have more variety, more invention, more uh, different styles of gauges have come along over the years. So back then they were just saying, yeah, it's the rule of thumb for the military to, you know, to, to work with their contractors. Um, and GD and T was just getting started. There weren't a whole lot of standards being enforced or used. The war just ended basically. Um, and so capability studies was training universal, right? You had, you just had, you know, a bunch of suppliers working with the military. And then you had a bunch of other industries not involved with the industry, not involved with the military. So, um, Basically, the simple rule, make sure the gauge accuracy is 10 times smaller than the tolerance. Um, that's basically what it was saying in 1950. Um, in 1996, military standard 120 was canceled. So it had a good run. Uh, the military decided, basically, we're going to move towards the ISO standards as more international suppliers became more commonly used. It just made sense to go with the ISO standards than to keep creating and maintaining these military standards. So one of the standards that has come about uh, with the cancellation of 120 is AIAG 2003. And what they did is consider the process variability and measurement um, and tolerance specification. So the resolution of the gauge must be able to divide the smaller of the two into 10 parts or more. This is a very complicated way of restating the 10 to one rule, but it had to do with resolution. If you notice the, the 10 to one rule in 1950 had to do with accuracy. So there's been a shift from accuracy to resolution. And so usually the tolerance specification is larger than the process variability. The, the definition has you know a little complex wording there, but so usually we're talking about the tolerance specification is bigger than the process var uh, variability because if the process varies a lot, you know, if your tolerance is this big and your variation is also this big, that's going to be hard to control. Um, so when you use this rule, when the, you know, tolerance is this big and your resolution is this big, um, it's going to reduce a lot of the instrument caused errors, not the human errors, not the environment errors, but just the gauge errors. So essentially both standards are saying if your instrument resolution can divide the tolerance by 10 parts or more, the tool is good enough. Again, I don't, these are rules of thumb. We don't have hard rules, just good enough. And you know, 10 parts or more, um, <laughs> it's not, it's not the hardest, hardest requirement. Um, but the AIAG 2003 specifically separates process variability and tolerance. Process variability includes gauge R and R accuracy, precision, and the operator. So that's taking a look at, you know, how well can you use, how well can you use this gauge? How good condition of the gauge, the design of it, the application of it. Um, tolerance is found on the print. So tolerance is... Um, just hard numbers here on the print and, and the title block. So um, it kind of requires you to look at the whole system. You're looking at your gauge and your print, comparing them and making your decision. It's not arbitrary. Um, so here's an example of 1,000 tolerance zone. Micrometer might have one ten thousandth resolution, resolution here on the sleeve, uh, but if it's plus or minus three tenths, maybe maybe it's a big caliper. This you know, big um, micrometer. I don't have any bigger ones here handy, but as these get maybe to ten inches or twelve inches in size, um, the accuracy uncertainty is going to be three tenths, and so that may not be good enough under the rule, because even though it has a resolution, um, it's got that plus or minus three tenths uh, with every measurement. Uh, so this is where the uncertainty ratio comes into play. So um, this is another standard. 
ANSI NCSL Z540.3 in 2006, this essentially compares the size of your tolerance zone to the size of the gauge uncertainty. Okay, so we just mentioned uncertainty might be plus or minus a tenth on a small gauge like this one. And as it grows to 10 inches or 12 inches or 15 inches, it might be plus or minus three tenths. Um, and this is normally applied to calibration, but it can also be applied to gauge selection. So normally when you're like saying, I'm going to calibrate this, it comes down to the gauge you choose to calibrate against, whether it's a Joe block or something else. Um, but it can also be applied to when you're choosing which tool to use to measure your part. Um, you can use the same concept. So in general speaking, you still want that 10 to 1 ratio, uh, whether you're looking at the resolution or the manufacturer stated accuracy, you want that 10 to 1 ratio. But that's hard to do in modern manufacturing with um, how tight tolerances have gotten. Gauge accuracies have almost reached their limit in terms of, you know, a micrometer or a caliper. Um, there's probably room for room for improvement, but manufacturers are just moving towards new gauges, CMMs, optical. They're not spending a whole lot of time in improving these. So um, you sometimes will settle for four to one or three to one. And in the case of a really tight tolerance zone, and a really accurate gauge, it sometimes still comes down to one-to-one -to -one in very extreme cases. So in this example, we take the tolerance zone, we take it over the gauge uncertainty, which will be stated by the manufacturer pretty much as a plus or minus uh, value, and helps you choose if you have the correct gauge for the job. So if you can imagine that, you know, that what does that look like? A four-to-one ratio, maybe a three-to-one ratio, if that gauge uncertainty box got bigger and you had to use it, are you certain you, know, you don't have a big margin for error on either side if that gauge uncertainty grows um, and you still wanna be in your tolerance zone? So it, 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 can, be, uh, it can be challenging sometimes. Um, so as I said, this is, the, this is probably the rule that I would, you know, out of the three, the 1920, the 1950s military standard, the AIAG from 2003 or the 2006 Z540.3. I tend to use this one as my guide for, for what I'm doing. And it focuses on the resolution. Resolution is usually a um, good uh, indicator for how accurate it's going to be and for how um, precise it's going to be. They usually go hand in hand. And, um, you know, the standards kind of recognize that. But as I said, you get a big micrometer and suddenly your accuracy gets plus or minus bigger, but the resolution stayed the same. Um, in some cases, in other cases, the resolution dropped off. Sometimes these, as these micrometers get bigger, you lose that 10th scale accuracy. They don't even give it to you, right? You just get uh, the thimble, uh, you get to see where the thimble stops. So check out my other videos on micrometers, on vernier scale, uh, if you're not sure what I'm talking about. I have some, some examples about that, if you haven't watched them already. Um, so you got to watch out for situations where the resolution is small and the accuracy error is high. Right? That's the one kind of caveat for this total uncertainty rule. So you might have a high precision CMM. Pre CMMs are very precise. When you, when you looked at that... Um, the, the video I did on accuracy and precision, the CMMs are, are very precise, but they're going to state their accuracy as higher than the precision because CMMs are designed to be repeatable, get the same value at the same time, but the number they report, they will say has a plus or minus accuracy issue for a diameter, a distance, whatever it is they're measuring. So sometimes 10 to 1 diff is difficult to maintain in those tight tolerance situations. And the whole point of my video, I've probably confused you and contradicted myself a dozen times. And that's the reality of the situation. I just want you to be aware and thinking about it, thinking critically and not just um, blindly following certain rules, because this is one area where you just can't do that. The best people in the industry are thinking about what they're using. 
thinking about the environment they're in and the technique they're using and how they're making the decisions. So just, uh, I've tried to give you your, the, the full picture for you to make your decision as it applies to your industry, your job. Um, but for my industry and my job may, may not apply to what you're doing. So these, but these, these concepts, look up these, you know, look these up on the internet, try to download them, ask your company. Some of these are, have some interesting, um, information inside them and look up some other, um, some other references. Don't just get my opinion. If you want more uh, insight, uh, feel free, please, uh, do, do a little bit more research. Talk to some people at work as well. So, um, that's it for this video. I want to thank you guys for watching and watching the other ones. Please uh, check out the website, pragmaticmetrology.com, where you can find uh, more resources, more videos. Um, I want to thank, as I always do, I thank the Laney um, College in Oakland, providing me a lot of these tools and, and parts to use as examples for these videos. The te machine technology program at Laney has a lot of great courses on manual machining and CNC machining, uh, quality control, metrology, inspection, CMMs, um, what else? Um, CAD modeling, CAD design, blueprints, you know, how to make these, how to read these, uh, mechanical drives. They have a lot of classes. Please check them out. They've got... Um, not, not just classes, but they offer certificates if you take enough classes in certain categories. Um, they offer associate's degrees as well as apprenticeships. So you can really build up your resume and advance your career. Uh, so again, that's Laney College, the Machine Technology Department. They're in Oakland, California, the Northern California Bay Area. Uh, please check them out. And um, I, I always... I'm always very grateful to them for providing me this opportunity to use their couple of their gauges and, and, and the parts. So um, please check out my website again. Thank you. And I will see you for the next video.